Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of my channel, Norman Stickle, Toxic Medium Breakthrough Coach. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to tune in and have a listen at some of these things that I might be able to gain some light and some insight onto. It is much appreciated. If you have not already done so, please like and subscribe if you feel this is a good fit for you. But with that being said, a little background about me is I'm a master certified coach of hypnotherapy and neural logistics programming. I'm also a master energy healer and have a lot of personal experience within the realm of overcoming self-limiting beliefs and taking on decisions that have inhibited my growth for the good portion of my life along with a fairly de lifelong debilitating disease up until about the age of 30. So from then on, it has been one big learning experience through the process of self-realizing a lot of these moments that I have talked about previously in some of my other videos and also going through these things myself firsthand to be able to need to be able to attract these things into my life. Yes, I said attract these things into my life. It sounds a bit crazy, but that's really what it is. Do I can bring these things into my awareness so that I may better understand where I need to be able to learn and grow myself and in turn be able to bring this back to a place of service to people like yourself that may need a little bit of help along the way but from a humble place of doing so and with that being said, today's topic is going to be about some of the most telltale signs of covert narcissism and what to look for and some of the red flags. These, for me, on a specific note, really closely first-hand experience comes with being from a personal relationship standpoint, but I have also had other covert narcissistic people in my life on a professional level, in my career, and in my close inner circle of, you know, family members and friends even. So there is really no limitation to where you might see these things and who might be taking on these habits and these traits. But you really got to look and feel out these things to really figure out if and really use your own judgment when it comes down to it to really come to the conclusion that somebody really is a true covert narcissist because it is a matter of really perceiving and perception of whether you think they are or not worst case scenario they're not but you think they are and there was a maybe a misunderstanding or whatnot and all of a sudden that person's not going to be around anymore because, you know, you've been hurt, they've been hurt. There's things that are said, you know, and whatnot. So all these things are taken into consideration and really go through the process of figuring this out on your own. And for me, it was a firsthand experience over a period of time in my life after I went through a very, fairly traumatic stint of having a craniotomy and... Then within a very short period of time of going through that and kind of being released back onto my own two feet, having to figure a lot of things out on my own, not having the general and needed support that I should have been given, but also the fact that my world was turned upside down by a fairly, what I would call, traumatic emotional event preceding after my craniotomy and being released. And literally my world came crashing down. And from a emotional standpoint, my world rug was pulled out from underneath my feet to where I was caused a very traumatic, rapid downfall in some of the events that happened. But with that being said, almost immediately... As soon as that downfall and collapse happened, my world went from taking a straight down nosedive into an extremely rapid upsailing 
of something that I thought at the time was, had a lot of great potential. And I say that because what it did is I was very confused and very torn from having the rug pulled out from underneath my feet and having a lot of things stripped from me in my home situation, my private life and all this stuff. But at the same time, I couldn't really discern whether this was a good move or a bad move in the situation from a point of, okay, maybe this is happening because I need it. I was feeling abandoned. My confidence was way down and I was in a really, really tough, dark place in my life at that moment. But it was almost seeming as if I was being rescued to a degree. And I remember wrestling with myself of, I don't want this, but maybe I need this. It's coming to me at the right time. So maybe I should just go with it. And there was all these conflicting feelings and signs. And I was fresh out of the hospital still less than a year after the hospital. So a lot of things were very vulnerable for me at the time. And I was thrown into this relationship where it really felt like I was being rescued in a sense, but it was something that I needed. It felt like I was out of options. And this was the only way forward was by going into this. And it felt like I was really thrown into it even though I wasn't ready. And through this process, I just remember being super confused and dumbfounded at what the hell was even going on, really. So, with that being said, it was very exciting at the time, just like a lot of new relationships are. But also, it was very taking me back because shortly after being getting into the relationship, I started getting a lot of conflict, conflicting feelings and signs that something wasn't quite right. And when I say that, it was really within the first maybe about three months of, of the relationship, coming into this relationship. And at the time, I still wasn't working. And I had just been, like I said, fresh out of the hospital and really just starting to get my grounded, my feet grounded in, in my own recovery after not being approved for support through the doctors and counseling and certain things that I really felt I should have had. They didn't see the need for it. So I was kind of left to my own demise to figure this stuff out on my own. And uh, I am very thankful that I didn't go without and that I was not left completely homeless, of course, because we're always provided what we need to a degree, but also too, there's always a lesson in everything that we come across. So the, we'll get to the bigger lesson of that later, as you'll see. But one of the hugest things right off of the bat was for me going into this and where I'm leading that with the, the, the signs of being, uh, being around a covert narcissist was what I now know as the love bombing phase, the idealization stage. And, you know, it can be a tough one to decipher because a lot of relationships really do are exciting. You know, there might be a lot of physical intimacy and you want to talk all the time and you don't want to spend time apart and all these things. But you also kind of instinctively know that there should be some sort of balance within it, especially as the older you get and you've had a little more experience within these things and whatnot. You know, and depending on how long you've been possibly single or whatnot, you might want a little more balance. You know, maybe you feel like you're kind of being pushed or rushed into things, you know. Um, so I don't know how in tune you are with your inner guidance system or your, your voice, your higher self, your subconscious. There's multiple names for it and everybody's got a different term for it, you know, but and that can really vary person to person, situation to situation. But for me, it was such a dramatic ex experience and I was leading up to this before the surgery and even after the surgery leading up to the collapse of what I knew was my world at the time, my confidence level was already down before and during that process. So then it was even thrown farther down once the rug was completely pulled out from underneath me. And 
And then it was like my ego took this skydive up and I was being shot up emotionally. So it was very confusing. So I just kind of learned to embrace it. And it was something fresh and it was new and all these, you know, feelings. I was being flooded with all these emotional feelings. My body was riding so high. But in the back of my head, something was kind of off. And I remember the first night, um, I heard the words, I love you. And I remember saying it back. I was like, well, maybe I should just go with this. And it was kind of just automatic. Well, I now know that that was not a healthy thing either here and, and a healthy thing to state. Because I knew, didn't really, I knew this person, but I didn't know this person. And love that I now understand, love, it is something that grows and is nurtured and takes on. It, there's different stages of love, you know, and you go through the infatuation and all these other things. And is it really true? But something that that is just like then and there, absolutely not. That's hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> and, you know, it was something that I thought was kind of weird, even when I said it. But I was, you know, like I said, maybe I should just go with it. And I did. But it never felt quite right. I did grow to love this person because I spent a, quite a significant period of time with this person starting right then and there. And I really, you know, there are things that I still, you know, came to appreciate and love about this person. But at the same time, it was an immature kind of love and hence some of these reasons that I have talked about in my other videos and whatnot. But, so the love bombing for me was super intense and all the attention was on me. And I felt like a king. I wasn't working, you know, I had a house over my, a roof over my head now and all this exciting stuff and I was doing adventures and, you know, living this life that I had never really lived before because it was all, all totally foreign to me and whatnot. So I was, you know, kind of, okay, let's, let's go with it. And I did. And as time went on, there was this aching feeling in my stomach. And this leads me to the second point, but something was off. Something felt off. And it was a combination of things for me. But, so, point one, the love bombing stage, the idealization stage. Point number two, something is off. Could be a feeling, an action, something that's said through words, phrases, things like that. And it can be difficult to pinpoint. And it's usually very subtle to begin with. And for me, it started about three months into my relationship, which is pretty standard for the mar narcissistic tendencies, where the love bombing will tend to kind of start to wear off. Maybe it fully hasn't, but at the same time, it has started to kind of subside, which, you know, there's different phases of a relationship and narcissistic relationships are no different, but at the same time, there are a different dynamic to the narcissistic relationships more so than a healthy relationship. So for me, it started about three months in and it started by asking to borrow some money. And with that, I had recently started working shortly after entering the relationship, not right away, but I had got my, my, my previous job back that I had left to go on this adventure for my medical surgery and whatnot over the period of about two years. And I remember putting the pieces together and kind of being like, well, that's kind of strange. And over a period of time, the feelings and the actions and the words and the, the slight questioning was innocent, but it all felt weird. And I, I have covered some of this, of these, exactly what happened in my other videos. But I remember just discounting it and not paying much attention to it. I was like, oh, well, okay, we'll see how it goes. And it would kind of go by the wayside and it would be brushed off with myself and with the other person which will cover some of the other things, and I don't want to jump ahead, but 
there's a sense of shine, you know, innocence to this whole process of brushing things off and the words that are said and, you know, discounting things that makes it seem, eh, okay, well, maybe, you know, that's just weird. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. You know, maybe it's not that. So with that, you know, it's, it can be kind of hard to really track and pinpoint and really get your finger wrapped around it until it's really has caused some serious damage. So the third thing would be passive aggressiveness. And that really, even though there still may be about three or you know four or so months in, every, every aspect of this cycle is gonna be a little bit different per case on a case by case basis, but you might start seeing signs of passive aggressiveness through simple little phrases, twisting of the word and the tongue, judging of, you know, well, I no, you did that. And a little bit of condescendingness, you know, they're poking at you, but they're not poking at you. It's very subtle to begin with. And it's so subtle in some sense that you don't even catch it right away until it's too late. But what it does, at least it did for me, is it snuck in on the back end of what I was listening to because I was paying attention to the body language and what I, what I thought she was saying. But at the same time, I didn't catch all of it until after the fact. So it's very subtle to begin with. But make mo no mistake that just because it's subtle doesn't mean that it's not causing damage and it's not seeping in because it is. So with that passive aggressiveness, there's little things like undermining, like, well, you know, I don't work as much as you do. Or, you know, I had to, I had to use it to pay one of my other bills when it comes to finances. Or, oh, don't you, don't you remember? You, I, I did that last time. It's your turn. And it's these little tiny little things that add up over a period of time. And it's kind of like arguing, but it's not really because what they're doing is they're twisting the situation to match their benefits and their needs. And in turn, it causes you to create that little bit of self-doubt. And it catches you off guard to the point where you have to like, you hesitate and you're like, well, maybe I did say that. And that is poisonous because now you're creeping in with seeds of self-doubt and you're second guessing yourself of whether you did or not. Unbeknownst to you, it's all a manipulative tool and it's the way that it works. So it's a lot of things with a covert narcissist are gonna be super subtle, especially in the beginning. It's gonna be very difficult to catch on. Number four, and this for me started around three months. The love bombing stage was still going fairly strong, but at the same time, it had kind of started to cool off a little bit, but not enough to really no, and it's difficult to know how and when the transitions are starting to be made because most of the time you're not aware of it and you're not really in control because everything else is being played out and orchestrated by the other party. So it's very micromental steps in the process. But this one for me started around the same time and it was the devaluing stage. And this is goes hand in hand with the passive aggressiveness of things like gaslighting. I didn't say that. You said that. I'm not the crazy one. You're the crazy one. Well, no, you don't remember doing that? And again, this is a lot of this will be, you'll find a common theme in a lot of this. And for me, my experience with the covert narcissism, a lot of it is in their words and their actions and the feeling. I, I talk a lot about the energetic feeling that we, if you're, in tune with yourself and your body, you can very much so pick up on other things. Like your gut knows when something's not right. Your gut knows when you don't like somebody. Your gut knows when something's wrong. But it's difficult because your emotions are up here because you can feel it, you know, and you don't want to. But you're being basically led and taught and guided that the, your feelings are not valid. 
and that the importance lies in, in, in them. And they take precedent over your own needs and your own feelings. And it's all super subtle. And a lot of it is a game on your subconscious mind. I don't want to go too fast. <laughs> so the devaluing stage, gaslighting. This is, might even be when the triangulation starts. I have a video on triangulation. You can go look that up. That is a huge thing. And that in itself is gossiping, spreading rumors, a lot of things like that. Because... The whole time, this might even be started from the beginning, but as soon as they start getting ammo on you and reasons that they can start keeping a scorecard on when you mess up, they'll let you know. They'll let you, they'll remind you. They won't let you get away with it. And what it's going to do is they're going to start keeping track. And I am the type of person now that the past is the past. It's done and gone with. Let's learn. Let's, let's, let's deal with it. Let's move on. Let's have closure and so on and so forth. But somebody like that, people outside of being narcissists do live and bring up the past fairly regularly. And it is not healthy because then you're placing your energy in the past. We'll get more about that later. But with that, it's going to cause a lot of these techniques to start to kind of show themselves a little bit. And again, you might be really starting to wrestle with yourself. You may not even be completely aware of it. It depends on how oblivious you are or how in tune you are you know and if you're somewhere in the middle you might catch bits and pieces of it you might kind of entertain the idea that something's weird but then again you might blow it off because all of a sudden you're back at the love bombing stage and this all plays into itself but with the devaluing you have gaslighting the triangulation dismissiveness they might dismiss your feelings like i just mentioned and put theirs feelings and their needs and wants over yours well, I want to do this. You know, I don't want to do that. And then it causes you, instills that feeling of guilt and shame for you to not put your feelings second and theirs first. And, you know, life is give and take. So there are times that it's okay and healthy to do those things. But when it's consistently, it becomes unhealthy because then you're not taking care of yourself. And then you're learning and you're being trained, basically, to put them before your own. And that is not healthy. So this is all going to... So when it really starts with step three, passive aggressiveness, step four, devaluing, using the tactics of triangulation, gaslighting, the content sending behavior, snide comments and remarks and things like that, it's going to be kind of on repeat and go back and forth. And it did for me. It was like this, this tug at and pull yo-yoing effect of love bombing after there's a, a, a short period of tension. And this might last for just one little spout, might last for a couple of hours, it could last for a couple of days. You know, really it's, it's going to be on a case by case basis. But then they're going to come back and they're going to start fixing everything. And they're going to love bomb you again and make you feel important again. So you're, you're being torn down but then you're being brought right back up. And that in itself is very dangerous because what it does is it's causing this confliction within your mind and your heart. You're literally being, whether you realize or not, you're literally being torn between what you're feeling and what you're thinking, what you should do and what you shouldn't do, what is right and what is wrong, and your own value system. And that's really doing a lot of damage way deep below the surface, but you tend to kind of just want to go for it. Or you might be on the complete other spectrum of where you realize what's going on. You might have a great big awareness. You might be the type of person to just pack up shop and leave. And that's the best thing you could do is when you see all those red flags. If you feel uncomfortable and you try to confront the person and it's not working out, by all means, at this point, it's only been a very short new thing you're not really invested enough to really stick around. So by all means, in my experience, I stayed because of my confidence level and a lot of the things I had already going into this phase of my life and this new and this relationship that I was definitely not in a healthy place already coming into it. So this really tended to make it worse and it amplified all those things and caused even more doubt stuff within my own self. So. So far, we've covered love bombing, 
Number one, the idealization stage. Number two has been something is off. Number three has been passive aggressiveness, included with gaslighting and triangulation and, you know, condescending snide remarks and whatnot. Number four has been the devaluation stage. Number five, very entitled. But again, a lot of these things are very subtle. And this can lead to things like procrastination and asking you to do things and sitting while you maybe do the chores. Whether it be taking out the garbage, you know, or doing the dishes or whatnot, you know. They might do something here and there, but at the same time, a lot of this responsibility will be kind of pawned off on you. And like they're above and beyond doing certain things because they have this grandiose sense of personality and of self. But yet, we'll get to this other point in a moment and it kind of goes with it, but the sense of aloofness, of introspection, and because they're entitled and they feel that way, the catch is, is you provide them of something of value. We are a supply or were a supply to them, whether it be money, physical intimacy, a vehicle, a roof over their head, money in their pocket, companionship. A lot of them have their different thing and they, a lot of them will have different supplies for different needs. And that is a tough one and we can talk about that at a different time. I may have even covered it in some of my other videos and mentioned it, but that can be a tough one to not only catch, but it can also be something that is very difficult to prove, although you should never discount your gut feeling. So with that really being said, the entitlement will really, I want to do this and you just did that. And it, it tends to throw in the guilt and it's a way of manipulating you into doing what they want to do and putting their needs before your own. Again, you might see the cycle here. It goes back to the condescendingness, the gaslighting, possibly the triangulation, you know, and things like that. Well, Bobby didn't treat me like that. And I want to do this. And we did that last week. So why can't we do this this week? You know, and again, this is about you finding out a healthy balance in things because it is healthy and beneficial to put our own needs aside to, to a degree, to a degree and, and healthy that we meet on the middle ground as far as it being a healthy aspect of a relationship. But there's a difference between healthy and unhealthy, and it can be a very fine line at points in time. So only you can really discern when, when and where that line is drawn. And I really, you know, you know, pay attention to it because it will sneak up on you and it will also get away from you just as quickly as it does show up. So that only you really truly know where that line is between healthy and unhealthy. Again, this can go back to boundaries. I just did a, a video on boundaries. So if you don't have boundaries, go watch that video there and find out more about it. But also too, this is where boundaries come in with these things. And a lot of this can all be tied together in one big circle. What's bringing up different points as, as it sees fit. So with the, after the entitlement, which was number five, I would say that number six, very cunning, smooth talking. And I say that because for me, a lot of it was noticing the body language, the tone of voice. And they always seemed to know what to say, when to say, and how to say it. Like they, there was no hesitation a lot of it time. Maybe a few times, but if there was, I didn't really get it. When I know, looking back, I can bring up some of the situations where I f would feel the rush of anxiety and the emotions that I was underneath the surface, but the body language was not speaking that. And it just seemed to be such a smooth transition that I didn't even question it. And I think that's part of it is you're less likely to actually question the motives and the words and the actions if it seems 
and a lot of times is often very natural for them. Because most likely at this point, that's probably not the first once, first time or the hundredth time that they have used these tactics, first of all. And second of all, because of their sense of grandiosity that they have and being covert, they're not going to really wear it on their sleeve. It's going to be more or less below the surface as of where some of the other narcissists are a little more bold about certain things and tactics and not as shy about these things. And we'll definitely let you know up front. But what it is, is it just seems so natural that it's a lot tougher and it causes you to be a little more dismissive of what is going on and its true intention behind it. At least it did for me, so I would definitely look out for that. Number seven, the victim mindset. This was a big one. And from my experience and what I do know about covert narcissism, it will always be a big one, especially with the covert narcissist, because they tend to kind of hide that victim mindset. And again, a lot of this is in the delivery, their body language, the, the words and the phrases they use. Well, what about me? Or, uh, you know, I, and you did that. I did this. I don't want to do that. You want to, but you always want to do this. And it's that second guessingness that goes back to the undermining and the cunningness and being suave, you know, suave about the way they deliver their words and things. So with that, you know, they're... They're going to pass blame. There's going to be things that goes, and this goes back to the, pro, the procrastination of things, you know. Well, I don't feel like it. Will you do the dishes? You know, that's an underlying effect. I mean, you'd be like, well, didn't I just do the dishes? Isn't it, you'd be thinking, isn't it my turn? Isn't it your turn? Like, we're supposed to be doing this together, you know. Oh, you know, I have a stomach ache. Will you do it? And that kind of, we naturally as human beings want to help for the most part. And that's a natural thing. So then we feel like, okay, well, I guess I will do it. I'll, I'll get it this time. You know what I mean? Or it could be the bill at dinner, you know, instead of going Dutch, that maybe most of the time it does. Unbeknownst to you, you know, all of a sudden you get the bill, but you have no inkling going in, you know, because they pass it off as something else. So they forgot they did this or they did that. You know, and it all this is all tied in with the techniques of gaslighting and possible triangulation and what not. So the passive aggressiveness is it's a lot of it is comes back to a passive aggressive cycle. And it is all playing into the bigger storyline of everything that's going on below the surface that's really unseen, but it can be felt if you are in tune and playing and, and in touch with it. So with that, they're going to exploit your insecurities. They can they'll be able to tell when you're feeling shame and guilt and when you want to do something and you try to possibly stand up they're going to use that against you it happened to me and what i mean by that is is maybe not in the very beginning of the relationship but as the relationship went on there was moments in time where i paid attention to this little voice in my head and thought something was weird and i was like you know what? i really need to do something about that and i tried and i failed quite miserably a few times before I finally got the hang of it and finally ended up following through. I discussed a little bit of that about in the boundaries and some of the other videos that I've done. But also, too, the exploiting your insecurities is huge, not only because it plays into the condescending remarks and the passive aggressiveness and the gaslighting and all the, you know, the guilt trips and the, you know, making and putting the blame and the shame back on you, but at the same time, they're going to tend to draw those qualities out of you. And by that, they're actually pushing you down and raising their own sense of self and, superior, and superiority over you. And because they have a false sense of self, they're actually raising their own self-image by holding space like they're better than you and pushing you farther down, they're actually raising their sense of self. It's a very twisted cycle. And these are the effects that actually start to happen below the surface of what all this is going on. And these are the things that take 
depending on who you are, the resources you have available, and the certain things that you might have gone through will take years to unravel what really the F happened to you. <laughs> so, you know, this insecurities were a huge thing for me. And you're really not going to heal in the environment that makes you sick. So if at any point in time up until this point, you have figured some of these things out and there are so many red flags, no matter how scared or fearful you are, seek help and get it. If you have the realization that this is what's going on. Because the sooner that you are able to curb this cycle and this yo-yoing effect of love bombing and devaluing, and this is still going on through this process. And this might now be from say three months when it started into six months, eight months, a year. There's really no end because once it starts, the cycle is not going to end until you put an end to it. Or you just really stop supplying them with whatever it is they need, whether it be finances, a house, food, you know, it doesn't matter. It's all different for everybody. Once you start not supplying them anymore, they will discard you first. But it sounds cruel, but one of the best things you can do is actually the relationship run as fast as you can. So it took me a long time to learn that. So after exploring your insecurities, point eight, we move on to point nine. They come across as very shy and introverted. And somebody like that is has a air of mysteriousness to them. You know what I mean? Like, something about that person. I just can't quite put my finger on it. But at this point, that hasn't given off the feeling or the vibe that it's weird. It's just like, it almost draws you in to want to go talk to them at first. Whether it be through a mutual friend, whether you see them at the bar, you know what I mean? Like, so really up front, like you have no idea. And a lot of this is hidden very, very well. And with that, um, there's going to be a lot of secrecy behind it. And, you know, the... A lot of these tactics are going to be very subtle with the covert narcissist. So that's number nine. It's going to roll us into number 10, emotionally unavailable. I talked a little bit about that already, but they have a sense of detachment, not only from you, but from their self. Their sense of self is completely detached emotionally. So they're very aloof. They're not going to be there when you need them to. They're going to keep themselves at a distance. And almost because they're standing above you on a pedestal. And they put themselves there because as they devalue you and they, they chip away at your confidence and they undermine your sense of self through this whole process very intricately and very subtly over a period of months, years possibly, depending on how long this is going on, what's going to happen is, is your ground that you're standing on or you think you're standing on is going to be so undermined that when you do try to talk to them, and come to them and confront them, even if it's from a pure place of genuineness. And you don't have any vindictiveness about yourself. Like you don't, you're not fired up and angry, like you're just gonna storm in there and just rip their head off with anger. But from a genuinely point, approaching them, as you would any other person or partner, friend, coworker, boss, doesn't matter. You know, if you have an established relationship with this person and you genuinely think that you care about them, you want to talk and not just go in there like World War III and just blow the place up. So there is definitely an approach to it. But when you go about doing this, possibly, if you ever get to this point of doing so, they're going to keep you at a distance. And it's something, again, pay attention to your feelings. You will, you will sense this through your feelings. Your internal radar is going to go off like something ain't right. And it did mine, but I ignore it for a very long time. And I would say that from my perception, I got closer and was able to have more insight than what I feel they ever let anybody did before me. 
And that's just the way I perceive it because I'm a very acknowledged, energetic person. I'm very in tune. And that was through the process of growing at it. And there was some connections and prior rapport and certain things, you know, that played into it, I think. And there was a certain softness about the situation. But at the same time, there was always that little bit of that distance that was kept. So I wasn't even immune from it. Even as close as I did get, I was still not immune from, from that. So emotionally unavailable. was number 10, kind of reflecting for a moment. Number 11, extremely secretive. This was a big one for me. I remember like really this playing in my insecurities a lot, totally a lot. Like so much so that it literally drove me mad. To the point where I was literally so frustrated but I, I didn't know how I was going to handle it. And with this, it was really secretive about the phone, their time when they were out, what they were doing. And again, it kind of goes to this air of condescendingness and, you know, whatnot. A lot of this in the delivery, if you go to ever, like, confront this person or bring something up, you know, that will... These techniques of gaslighting and, and the condescendingness and this air of superiority will come over, you know, this person and they will start to inflict these things again. So here we are going back through the cycles of possibly love bombing, devaluation stage and whatnot. And these things are not necessarily specific to one stage or another. They can be used at any point in time when they seem deem them necessary to use them. So with that being said, you know, the... I remember a few times I had tried to assert myself and have an open book, you know, have a open communication and really convey my concerns in these certain areas, which were really what I feel now as my insecurities playing out and coming to the surface. And I had every right to be. I didn't know any better at the time. But at the same, in the same point, as I see it now, like she's her own person, I was my own person. But that was part of my identity. And I thought that I had the need to know and there was something weird, but what it was, was it was a miscommunication between what I thought it should be like, what it was like and what I was feeling. And I was really having a hard time sifting through all those feelings. It was just churning up inside myself. But really my gut was telling me something ain't right here, something ain't right here, something ain't right here. And my delivery and stuff was completely off about it, but it is what it is. It was a big, big learning experience. And I never, could necessarily pinpoint, although there was a couple of mystical experiences I had that really led me to some insight. And maybe I'll talk about those someday in a different video. But I truly believe that, you know, when the gut knows something, you know something, even if you never get tangible proof. But the truth will always come out in one sense, form, or, or another. But sometimes you just need to be able to make peace with it. And realize that you may never actually get the full truth. And especially with a narcissist, you never will. You never get the full truth out of them. So you really need to be able to come to make peace with yourself. And come to your own conclusions. And closure. And forgiveness. And leave it at that. They can be extremely jealous. That's point number 12. Because as long as you are supplying them with whatever it may be, you are... Kind of a possession. Well, not kind of. You are a possession. So they are going to be extremely jealous. And they're going to want to keep you for themselves. Because they are feeding off of that. And if there's a threat of possibly you being taken away from them and being admired by somebody else, they will not settle for that. They will literally start to go to battle. And you may not even be aware of it. They might go to the tactics of triangulation, very sneakiness and cunningness behind your back to spread rumors about you 
the other person possibly, the friends, the acquaintances, whatever it may be, they will literally stop at nothing to make sure. And I didn't really go to include this, but this can also lead into a smear campaign, which is kind of included in the triangulation. I have mentioned in some of my other videos and content, but the smear campaign is huge. And most likely you're gonna be unaware of, of what kind of damage is actually being done when it comes down to it. <laughs> um, I lost a lot of so-called friends due to this smear campaign and the triangulation techniques that were used against me. So I now know that that was really a blessing in disguise. And, you know, almost five years later, it doesn't make a difference. It makes no impact now in my life now and moving forward that I lost those people. And, but at the time, it seemed very damaging. So, you know, the, the jealous, jealousness, jealousy can really be a big one. Excuse me. It may not, it, may, it really is on a case by case basis. Mine never came up all that much. It did a few times, but mine was in a lot of different areas that some of these techniques were used and affected me personally. So after jealousy, I already kind of mentioned it and, and, and talked a little bit about it. I also have another video about it is point number 13, triangulation. Triangulation is a huge one. And this goes hand in hand with a smear campaign. This is talking about you or talking about others to you is also used as well to be able to correlate rumors, gossip, and good or bad things to you and other people in their either inner or outer circle. And this is also gives the narcissist a sense of higher sense of self. This allows them to be in control of your reputation. You know, I don't remember exactly right now who said it, but it has been said, I believe, quite a few times over the years, and I believe it's by a fairly famous person, that we cannot really control our reputation. But the one thing that we can control is our character. Because everybody, and I understand now that I've been through certain training and I have certain insights into the way that the mind-body connection works and things like that, but because everybody views the world from a different perspective, depending on their environments and their conditioning and all these filters that we all have, that have pretty much created us up, who, up into who we are right now at this very moment. We cannot control our reputation. But this is even further damaging when they start to use the triangulation technique behind your back and they tell people stories. And two, they can do the same thing to other people, to you. And you might just accept it unequivocally and not even think twice about it. Triangulation can start early in the relationship and by no means need to start late. It can be used whenever they see fit at any point in time. And it's just a tool in their belt to be able to use and gain control and keep power over you and the people around you. I was told at one point that I didn't have any friends. The only friends I had was because of this person. They were like right in my face. You know, and I, I, didn't, I don't even know to this day still some of the things that were said about me. And that's okay. Because I made peace with so I don't need to know these things. So triangulation can be a real, real hurtful technique that's used that you may not even be aware of the full effect of that it's actually had. And it does not have any boundaries between family, friends, co-workers, their friends, your friends. If they've met them and they have a contact with them, they are prone. And triangulation brings up another point that I actually didn't write it down, but is a good point to bring is this creates what most people in the community know as flying monkeys. People that will do and support them as they see fit because a lot of other people, if it's not their lesson and they still see this person a certain way and they're not privy of what's going on, you're going to get treated differently. But what's going to happen is they're going to support that person and then they're going to literally abandon you and start treating you differently. And then you're going to have this awareness be like, what is going on here? I thought this person, you know, like I thought we were going to hang out and all of a sudden 
they're distancing themselves from you. A lot of times, this will be the effect of triangulation. And you may not even be aware of it. And people will start treating you differently. That's probably one of the biggest red flags when it comes to triangulation. The people in your guys' common circle, or your inner circle, will treat you differently than, you, than, you, than they did before. And I'm not saying it's 100% proof of, but the probability of it being a side effect of the triangulation is very, very high. So keep that in mind. Point number 14. They'll make a lot of excuses for not wanting to do things. This is directly tied to procrastination, self-entitlement. They feel above you, like they don't need to do certain things. They want to be served. And, you know, this in itself, they feel like they you owe them something a lot of times. So they might come back to, you know, well, you know, I just paid the, you know, the, the power bill. Will you get dinner tonight? And they'll do it with that tone of voice where it's kind of condescending, maybe a little hint of guilt. But really, in a sense, we automatically want to help. So we're like, okay, you know, whatever. But really inside, like, you just paid for dinner last week or two nights before. All these little red flags. But see, all these little red flags I've been mentioning add up to really, really big red flags. <laughs> so you really, really need to be vigilant. And um, hopefully you really catch a lot of this in the infancy, in, infancy of when it is actually occurring and in the moment of when it's occurring, um, when it's not too late. Because most at this point in time anyways, then the damage has already been done. And you're not even aware of how much damage has been done to this point. So this one, next point, really tends to come for me. It was really a strong one towards the end when I was extremely adamant about putting my foot down. And I had tried several times. I mentioned in one of my other videos of distancing myself and ending the relationship successfully. It took me quite a few times to actually learn that process and to follow through with it. Again, back to boundaries, strength, confidence, a lot of these things. But before I mention the last one, one of the last ones that I actually have written down, we'll kind of recap, but first one I mentioned was love bombing, the idealization stage. Number two was Something is off. It's a feeling, words, actions, and it's usually something difficult to pinpoint. And it's very, very subtle usually in the beginning. Number three was passive aggressiveness through judgment, undermining, condescending phrases, toning, tones of voice, body language, things like that. Argumentative. Not like just, it could be, not necessarily explosiveness. Especially in the beginning, it's going to be a little more on the subtle side. But passive aggressiveness is usually a little more low-key than just downright just, you know, letting off the leash style. And they're intimidated by your confidence. So they're going to they're gonna chisel away at that as they see fit using the techniques of triangulation, gaslighting, condescendingness chipping away at that, making you second guess yourself and the line of questioning, all these techniques will play into that. If they sense that you are stronger than you are, they have to keep you down. A, because it, it raises their own sense of self, but also two, it kind of keeps you in your place and keeps you complacent. So that's a big, that was point, that was point three. Point four is devalue. That is using the gaslighting, the triangulation, condescending, tones of voice, techniques, phrases, words, things like that. Passive aggressive cycle of, you know, love bombing, devaluation, love bombing, devaluation. It's a very, very sick cycle. Their entitlement, they're very entitled to things, kind of in the sense of they're better than you and they're also, you know, you're there to supply and serve them to a degree. Cunning, very smooth talking. The words flow very easily which in turn causes you to seem like it's more natural, like it's actually some true intent, but really it's all, it's all below the surface, then it's not. Number seven, they have a victim mindset, but it doesn't really come out like that all the time. 
but it's always on the underlying. And it, for me, it kind of went back to that something was off. That victim mindset. They pass a lot of blame. Goes with the techniques of triangulation and gaslighting and whatnot. And they use those things to their advantage to be able to pass all that off onto you and make you feel guilty and ashamed for wanting certain things. And then in turn, because you feel that, you end up putting their needs first and your own wants and needs second or not at all, which was a big case with me in the first good portion of my relationship. They're going to exploit your insecurities. They're going to, through judging you and the condescendingness and all the techniques that I've already previously mentioned. Number nine. They seem shy and introverted, kind of sneaky and quiet. Again, back to that feeling of something's just not quite right. Emotionally unavailable, aloof, not only with themselves, but with you as well. You're always going to be a little bit of an arm's distance, just a little bit of an arm's distance. Extremely secretive, like they don't owe you an explanation. And they're right, they really don't. Because we each have our own individualities and we have a right to have our own private time and not answer to anybody else. But at the same time, it's going to be that feeling inside that just something's not right about it. And you'll be able to tell that they're not being totally straight with you. That's what causes the insecurity. Because I can see it on both sides, especially now. But when your gut is telling you, eh, it ain't right, it ain't right, it ain't right. There's, there's something to that. Pay attention to it. Jealous. They, they will go up and, and, and annihilate all forms of competition if necessary. If there is still value within you of you supplying them with something, they will go to battle. Not for you, for themselves. Because they don't want to lose you. The triangulation technique be used to you about somebody else without you even knowing it and two it'll be used against you to somebody else and that's a way of the of the narcissist keeping in control of the other people in your life unbeknownst to you and it does a lot of damage behind the scenes that you're not even aware of make a lot of excuses goes back to that self entitlement that they feel that they deserve certain things and actions and whatnot you know a lot of this is a big loop this was one of the hardest lessons for me. And if you have a hard time cutting this one off, send me a message because I can really I can really get down and, and gritty with this one. But it's the hovering. And what I mean by that is, is it's pretty self-explanatory, I think. But this is really when they realize that they are losing you, or they have an inkling that they're actually losing you, they're really gonna step up their game. They're really going to step it up, more so than probably before. And for me, it was this process of, like I said, tug and pull, push and pull, tug and pull, back and forth of being indecisive in my own mind, knowing I had to make certain moves, knowing I had to do certain things for myself, but seeing the outwardly signs, feeling guilty and ashamed and not knowing, not having the confidence and all this, this deadly cycle of the devaluation, the idolization stage was continuously going on through this whole process and I had completely messed up my sense of self and what I was supposed to do but I knew at the end I had to do the right thing so once I actually got to it and I was firm and there was a few a few correlating circumstances that really put the nail the proverbial nail in the coffin that really sealed the deal that made me literally say enough is enough but I was made to be so uncomfortable and because I stayed and I didn't take the action sooner, my situation got worse. And I'll never get that back. But you know what? I ended, I ended it when I did. And yes, I could go into the poor pity me. I should have done it a long time ago, that whole cycle, but that doesn't do me any good. It doesn't do you any good either. So take it right then and there and make a decision to stop done finif let it go and the hovering though is going to really kick in the love bomb is going to come back the idealization is going to come back and just know that if it does 
look for that red flag. It'll be waving very, very high because soon after that, and they get you back and they think they got you again, that devaluation is going to kick right back in again because they're going to go right back to the old ways. Happened to me numerous times. Listen to the urgency of my voice. Listen to the passion. <laughs> and this will continuously go on and on and on and on until you literally end it for good and go no contact. It's the only way to go about doing it. Because the hovering is, they're going to use the triangulation techniques for other people to get to you, to send you messages, spread rumors about you, good or bad or indifferent. But also too, they might send you things. They might send you a text. They might show up at your work. They might contact a family member. One of my situations, I even use my kids. And it went on for quite some time. Completely inappropriate. Are you kidding me? My kids are not pawns. You know, and it got bad. And I gave in a few times. I did, absolutely. They'll send that text. Hey, how are you? It's been a while. What's going on? Just something super subtle. And then all of a sudden, your first thing is to answer it. But that's the worst thing you could do because as soon as you do, you just gave them an in. Because now you're, getting a, you're giving them attention. Good, bad, or indifferent. A narcissist craves attention. Here's a little bonus fact. They crave attention. They'll take it whether it's negative or positive. Because they need to fulfill. They have an empty, a sense, an empty sense of self that they are looking to fulfill. A void. An emptyless void that they are trying to fulfill within themselves. And they will literally take any attention they can get. One of the texts one time is, for instance, it, oh, it means so much to me that you answered me. Boom, she had me. Had me. You kidding me? I could go again in the cycle of, oh, you were so stupid, you know what I mean, and say all that stuff and, and kick myself. But you know what? I had to learn it. It was one more time I had to learn to put my foot down. I didn't get it the time before that. So, you know what? <laughs> it is what it is. Yeah. That's a tough lesson. Learn it once instead of two, three, four times. There's a reason it's a lesson. The sooner you learn the lesson, the sooner the experience will be over. And the sooner you can start rebuilding your sense of self and getting your life back. Because that's really what you're fighting for. But because of the illusion... And you're in the thick of it. The illusion is, is fear, insecurity, no confidence. What's going to happen to this? What's going to happen to that? The neurons that go together, wire together, and fire together get stronger. You've been hardwired to feel these ways. Second guess yourself and all this stuff. And believe me, the only way to get through it is to walk into the fire. And if you don't do it and you're not willing to, you're never going to know what it's like on the other side. The other side of that is freedom. Freedom to find yourself. To do what you want. To claim your life back. To start over and fresh. The hovering stage was one of the, one of the toughest stages for me. Because I was in a situation where Financially, I was a little bit better off. And I had certain resources and stuff to my disposal. I felt like I was doing them a disservice, but that was something I had to wrestle with. And I had to really step outside of myself and really reflect and decide that I was going to take care of myself first. Most of us are brought up to put others first. And there are times to do so in a healthy fashion. But how can you take care of others if you don't take care of yourself because you can't pour from an empty cup you need to be able to take care of yourself as well and I was doing myself a favor by putting up boundaries like I mentioned in my previous video by taking the steps to end the relationship to go no contact to say enough is enough not only was I doing myself a favor but I was doing 
the other person a favor as well. Because I was not serving that other person. And what I was doing and allowing was not only healthy for me, but it wasn't healthy for them. And that is where integrity steps in. So I really hope this video has helped you, given you some insight. And by all means, please, like I mentioned at the beginning, like, subscribe, share if you feel this has really helped you or if you know somebody that might be in the thick of this, that needs to see this, by all means, please share it, like it, and subscribe. Because if we can all come together and help each other through the process, then somebody, one person at a time, might just get the chance to get their life back and see what it's like from an outside perspective. Never underestimate the power of planting a seed, even if that's what it is, just a seed. Because at some point, you have to relinquish control and let the ball stay in the other person's court and have them make the decision because we can't hold somebody's hand forever. And that's one of the toughest things to do in life is a lot of us are want to fix somebody, but you can't do it. They have to want it themselves. So even if you share this video and plant a seed in somebody, they may dislike you for it in a moment, but you might be look at it from the point, reframe it and look at it from a point of you are doing that person a favor. And it might just open their eyes. You never know what it might do for them. The power of it. And not just my videos, the other videos out there as well. This might resonate with some of you and other people. There might be other videos that resonate with you. It's all in the delivery. We all have, we all have that and there's no right or wrong with it. Again, like, subscribe, and share. Let me know in the comments below what you think. If you relate to this, give me a thumbs up. Give me some feedback. I would like to hear from you guys. Again, my name is Norman Stickle, Master Coach, and just somebody that really wants to spread the awareness. Thank you guys very much.